for coming from so many countries and regions around the world today. And great to hear about all those flavors of ice cream. I would love one after this webinar. <laughs> okay, so um, picture books to spark empathy and social justice actions is the topic of my webinar today. And as you can see at the top, I'm speaking today under the umbrella of, as Paul said, the Erasmus Plus Ice Pell project. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about the project and sharing some of that learning from the project during the webinar. So today then, this is what I'll be focusing on, or we will be focusing on together. First of all, I want to share a bit more about the Ice Pell project with you. Also, I want to explore how primary English language teaching can fuse or combine or integrate or embed intercultural learning and citizenship education. So we have three big areas there. We have primary English language teaching, intercultural learning, and to citizenship education. And the purpose, I suppose, of today's webinar is to think about how these three different domains, as I call them, can fuse and integrate through picture books. Then I want us to think about how we as teachers and teacher educators, materials developers, can use picture books as catalysts to spark or to trigger children's empathy um, with characters, with events, with situations, with world issues, and potentially going further than the empathy, spark and inspire and trigger social justice action taking. Then um, I'm going to share a picture book trailer with you and to brainstorm some of those intercultural citizenship education themes. And I will then share some creative activities that weren't developed by me, that were developed by some of the teachers who were participating in the ICEPEL project. And then reflect at the end on what are the benefits of working as a community of practice internationally when creating materials. So to sum all of that up, that mini introduction, I think what I'd like to do today with you and for you is to inspire you, give you some ideas so that you might create your own intercultural citizenship education materials using picture books for your learners, or if you work in teacher education for the teachers that you work with. And indeed, if you're in materials writing, to think about the ways you can maybe integrate picture books into that work. Okay, so the Erasmus Plus project then, the acronym ICEPEL. So ICEPEL stands for, as you can see there, Intercultural Citizenship Through Picture Books in Early English Language Learning. And um, it's a three-year project which finishes um, in August, so very soon. And I'm going to tell you about a big closing event that we have planned um, very, very soon for anyone who'd like to register who hasn't already. And the aim of this project is particularly to support teachers to confidently integrate intercultural citizenship education or ICE into English language lessons with children aged five to 12. So we're going from early years learners right up to upper primary, and in some contexts that could even be lower secondary through picture books. And this project involved a team of teacher educator partners and teacher and student teacher participants in five different national contexts. And you can see that the teachers and the teacher educators are based in Italy, Germany, Norway, Portugal, and the Netherlands. And that's the website, um, and I'll be referring to different things that's on the website throughout today's webinar for you to download and explore further. Now, I want to say, for all this is very much a European project involving European teacher educators and European participants, I think there is learning from this project that applies and can be used and adapted all over the world. And that's why I'm so pleased today to see people attending this webinar from many, many different countries, because I think using some of the creative principles from the project, some of the framework, some of the ideas, you can take those and adapt them for many different contexts within Europe and beyond Europe. Okay, 
So first of all, taking one of those big domains, I'd like to unpack a little bit this idea of what is citizenship education. There's very much linked to um, de de democrat democratic principles and supporting students to become active, informed and responsible citizens. So that active, that taking an active role. That's a big, big part of this ICEPEL project, the idea of taking action and helping children take action. And then we go on, who are willing and able to take responsibility both for themselves and for their community. So there's a big community focus as well in this project. And then we're talking at the local level, so my immediate community, also in my region, in my country, and very importantly, internationally. So we are moving from the local to the global in the concept of citizenship education. And in many countries in Europe, we're seeing citizenship education become more and more prominent in the national curriculum. So I'm, as Paul said, I'm based in Norway. I work in teacher education in Norway. And the new version of the Norwegian curriculum, which um, was developed in 2020, has a very, very strong citizenship education focus including within English language teaching. Okay, so what are the different components, if you like, of citizenship education? Well, we're talking knowledge, we're talking skills, we're talking attitudes and values. So developing these areas within these four key areas. So interaction, interacting effectively and constructively. And that is why um, I believe and many um, people working in this area believe in um, citizenship education marries very naturally, if you like, with um, English language education or language education more broadly, because it is about interaction. It is about communicating with others as a citizen and as a global citizen. Thinking critically, so um, many of you will be familiar with this, um, becoming more and more prominent in primary English language education and is a big component of citizenship education. Um, acting in a social responsible manner, so that this is the whole idea of taking action in the community, both locally and beyond. And finally, acting democratically. So those are quite um, aspirational, I would say, and they're very big areas. And we're working with children as young as five. So the, the challenge, I think, for citizenship education is how to do these big things in ways that are accessible to children who are developing conceptually, linguistically, and in many other ways. And that is what I suppose started this project. All right, so I'd like to know a little bit then, I've said just there that in my context, citizenship education is big, and in other contexts in Europe, certainly in the context of the partners in the ICEPEL project, but I want to know now in the chat box about your teaching context. So in terms of citizenship in your teaching context, is it A, a separate school subject where the children um, attend a citizenship class, within the school week? Is it integrated into other subjects in your national curriculum? Is it um, an important part of English language lessons? Because obviously that's very much our focus today. Or is it not prominent in the curriculum and or English lessons? So I'd just like you to type in the chat box um, the country where you're based and also any of these that apply to you, A, B, C or D just so we can have a little look at how widespread this is. Okay. Thank you very much. Quite a few Ds there, few Bs, some As. Okay, so a very varied picture. Well, that is interesting. That's very, very interesting. So what I'm proposing to you today is whether citizenship is huge 
and you're looking for ways to um, creatively infuse your curriculum, whether it's less prominent, but you feel as a, as a teacher in 2022 or as a teacher educator, it should be more prominent perhaps, if that's what you believe. Hopefully there's something for every one of you in this webinar today. All right, so moving along. So, um, that was citizenship education. Now we're gonna move on to look at this whole idea of intercultural learning. And I want to take, I mean, it's a very, very big area. And we could probably do a whole webinar on this, on just intercultural learning and what it is. But I want to take one particular concept and that links back to the idea of critical thinking. And it's a real re- um, shaping of understanding for English language teachers, I think, that especially those of us who, you know, grown up using course books in our teaching and the culture section in course books and how cultures are presented and how cultures are dealt with. It's a real departure from that, a departure from, you know, the five Fs, food, facts, fashion, folklore, all of those things, and a much more critical stance on culture. And this concept from um, Mike Byram, first developed in the 90s and, and subsequently refined um, in 2021, encouraging children to reflect critically on what is happening around them. And remember, we're thinking locally, regionally, nationally, globally, and then working together that whole interaction collaboration um, aspect in social, socially conscious ways by taking action. So it's a very much a kind of a reconceptualization of what is culture, what is intercultural learning, and how does that manifest in the classroom? So what does that mean for us in terms of teaching approaches, which is, you know, what's most important for us as teachers. Well, first aspect then is we need to use teaching approaches that are very much grounded in action, that us as teachers and the children we work with can take action out there beyond our classroom walls, because traditionally, as we all know, English teaching has been very much in here. So how can we take our learning and all our creative activities out there? So it's action learning and active learning that we're very familiar with in primary ELT nowadays all over the world, how can we use what we do inside the classroom and take it outside and beyond into the community? And the next one, which is going to sound a little bit controversial, I'm sure, is that the, these teaching approaches are political. Now, <laughs> what do we mean in this sense by political? Well, I'm using a definition from UNESCO there. Teachers and children are motivated by beliefs to become proactive contributors. So again, links to the action orientated above, the doing, that we're doing intercultural learning. We're not just acquiring knowledge about it, but we're doing things to a more just, peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure and sustainable world. And as I said at the beginning, these are big ideas. They're very aspirational. And sometimes it can feel they're out there. And you might think, oh, you know, I teach English. What, what's all this, you know, changing the world business about? Well, this is where, you know, the creativity happens and where the challenge happens in how to make this domain, this whole political domain, inclusion, tolerance, peace, sustainability, accessible to young children learning English. And, and that's where I think our project makes a contribution. And I hope by the end you'll agree with that. So it's a big ask and it's a big challenge. And that's what we've tried to do in this ICEPEL project is to bring together the domains of English language learning objectives with intercultural learning objectives and with citizenship objectives. And that's where we get this fusion that I talked about earlier. So how are we going to do that? How can we bring these big, big areas into one for our lessons? Okay, so this diagram there, as you can see, is a representation of the ICEPEL project. 
And if you look at the two circles there, context one and context two, you have those three areas. You have your language education, in our case, English language education, though this could be used with other um, languages, of course. You have the critical cultural awareness, so those ideas of the action orientated um, approaches and the political orientated approaches, and then the citizenship education, the socially responsible action in our communities, local, regional, national and global. And as you can see with those open pages of the book, in our project, it was through picture books. So we have a context there, for example, could be Portugal. And we have another context, context two, again, focusing on the same three domains through the picture book. And that could, for example, be Italy. And then coming together, the whole English language aspect, the whole communication aspect, um, vert through virtual collaboration and communication. In our ICEPEL project, we used an Erasmus platform called eTwinning. However, if you don't have access to this platform, this could be done in, through many, many different platforms, such as the one um, you're using right now. So a virtual platform where the children in context one can communicate around the picture book and around these three domains with children in another parallel context. And the idea is that by doing so, they can become intercultural citizens. So that is the model, if you like, of how in this project we've used picture books to bring, to fuse these three domains together and help children communicate around the domains in English. Okay. And of course, obviously, our vehicle, very much a vehicle that is the catalyst, in my view, that sparks the empathy, that sparks the curiosity, that helps teachers teach intercultural citizenship, is the picture book. And of course, there are so many picture books out there. How, you know, big question we often get from teachers is how do we choose a, a picture book that works for ICE? Well, there are many considerations, and I'm going to share with you a freely downloadable resource at the end of the webinar where there are some criteria to help you select picture books for ICE if you're interested in doing this in your own context. But just looking at these, these are, I mean, I think there are around 90 picture books that the teachers could choose from um, working together in um, what we called Erasmus groups. That's um, a teacher from each of the five countries. So Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Norway and Germany working together, choosing a picture book that they could develop for their class and then sharing those materials communicating, we saw context one, context two, it could be five contexts all communicating virtually around those materials, around those activities um, to take action. And I'll walk you through an example of that in a moment. But just looking then at, these are the pitch books they chose from the 90, and there are 18 examples here. And thinking about the different areas, so, Intercultural citizenship obviously is a big, big concept. What's involved? You know, those big areas like peace and tolerance and inclusion, etc. How can these picture books act as vehicles or ICE vehicles or what I like to call ICE catalysts? How can they do that? Well, these are some of the themes that emerge and um, naturally, I feel, from these picture books. So we have curiosity about appreciation of and respect for differences. We have migration and refugee stories represented here. We have um, local and global issues and the importance of water, um, standing up for others, treating others with mutual respect, relating to others' experiences, um, taking responsibility for making a difference, reflecting on the effects of war and conflict, personal and social responsibility in the community, environmental issues, coping with fears, ways to be kind, nature, indigenous people's rights, asylum and climate refugees. So the potential for bringing these 
real world issues into our English language lessons in a way that is accessible to children within that age range of five to 12, because obviously some of these picture books are more suitable for the children at the younger end of the age range, and some are more suitable for children at the older end of the age range. But the potential, the rich potential of these picture books to bring in those issues in, in ways that are accessible to children, comprehensible to children, relatable to children, that course books often struggle to do or don't do. So the potential for this vehicle is huge, and I really would encourage you to experiment with picture books that are suitable for your class and for your context. All right, I do have a bit of a cautionary tale, though. I'd like to share a story from the classroom, if you like, because <laughs> We can't be naive when it comes to this domain. We can't think, oh, I'm using this picture book, therefore my children are gonna find out all about you know, um, refugee experiences and they're all going to take you know, action in support of refugees. It's very, very naive and, and not, not very realistic, I feel. Um, so when we're working to develop empathy through picture books, we do need to bear some things in mind and hopefully the content in the second half of the webinar will give you some tools to maximize the potential of empathetic development. But first of all, a cautionary tale. So I was observing a primary lesson, not in any of those five countries actually, it was in a, a very different uh, context. Primary English lesson and the children were about nine years old. And the teacher, you know, um, very well intentioned, very experienced, actually, was sharing a picture book about a refugee experience. And one of the follow up activities, the creative response activities, was um, around the, the picture of the backpack. So if you had to leave your home really quickly, there was danger in, in your um, town, what would you take with you? So in terms of personalization, connecting the themes of forced migration, rapidly having to leave, danger, war, all of that, to children's experiences. The backpack activity seems to me to be um, logical, um, useful, child-friendly and engaging. And so one boy said, a chocolate milkshake, which, I mean, totally took the teacher by surprise. You know, the teacher was really, really taken aback by this quite divergent response by the boy. The boy hadn't been particularly engaged during the read aloud of the picture book. And um, so the teacher tried to mediate and really clarify that, you know, there's no time, you, you have to grab some belongings, you, you know, it's a really dangerous situation. You know, think again, what would you take? And then the boy responded, a pair of dirty socks. <laughs> now, I mean, on the one hand, you have to laugh at these divergent responses and the fact that children are being playful and, and, and so on in English. Um, on the other hand, though, you know, we are talking about a serious theme, uh, you know, a theme of conflict, a theme of danger, of people's lives being threatened and so on. So what I'm saying to you is, we shouldn't be naive and think, you know, children are all going to engage and relate, just as, as anybody, child, adult, teenager, whatever. Um, we can't force people to empathise. But what I'm advocating, what I'm emphasising in today's webinar is adopting pedagogical approaches, things that we can do as teachers, the change we can make as teacher educators to maximise the potential of empathy bearing in mind that the only person who you can force to be empathetic is yourself. So it's about using the picture book as a vehicle, using it as a tool to potentially spark empathy, but while being very mindful that not everybody will be empathetic with all situations. And I think that is just life. However, the approach I'd like to share with you today, which I think is very useful and, and not focused on enough in English language teaching, comes from Janice Bland, what she calls deep reading for in-depth learning. That if we want to maximize, increase the potential for 
empathetic responses from children to these global issues and situations, we need to move away from a more superficial comprehension driven approach to reading in ELT. And this deep reading increases the potential for deeper learning, deeper engagement, and a real desire to be curious about situations and want ultimate goal, big, big goal, ultimately want to do something about those situations. So she talks, Janice Glam talks about helping students deeply concentrate on issues by the kinds of focused reading tasks and listening tasks, because we're talking about picture book read alouds here, which is predominantly a listening activity, in addition to sharing their thoughts. So we often talk about empathy as a feeling, but we need to um, really try and focus on thoughtful feelings. So how we can help children share thoughts in creative writing and creative speaking. And she argues, Bland argues, this should be the heart of our ELT work for in-depth learning. She goes on to say that this is learning that supports children and teachers in gaining new perspectives on the world and ourselves, so that whole idea of personalization. It's not only about learning from others, because in all those themes I shared with you from those picture book selections, it's also about reflecting on ourselves as well. And she calls this, it's, she says it's sometimes known as world-mindedness, and that's that whole idea of moving beyond the the local, to the regional, to the national, and to the global. And world-mindedness is something we were very much trying to foster through our project. Okay, so that's kind of the, um, the umbrella, the foundations of this project. And now I'm going to share with you um, an example of one of the picture books. And I've chosen one of my favorite picture books and I have the real pleasure and privilege of mentoring um, the group of teachers, the Erasmus group who chose, they chose, not me, they chose We Are the Water Protectors. And this was for use with children aged nine to 12. So I'm just so you can get familiar quickly with the plot, I'm going to share with you the picture book trailer. I hope, Paul, that I shared sound. We'll find out if I didn't. So I'd like you to watch the picture book trailer. And as you watch, I'm going to give you two little thinking tasks. First one is how does the design, so not the text, but the design of the picture book, contribute to the visual narrative? So the story as told through the visuals, because remembering that the picture book is a very much a visual vehicle as much as it's a textual vehicle. And that is another reason why they're so suitable for English language teaching, because the visuals powerfully convey meaning in age and linguistically accessible ways. And the second question is, how might we are water protectors bring those three areas, remember English language learning, intercultural learning and citizenship education. How can this picture book fuse or marry the three domains? Now, Paul, can you give me a shout if we've got no sound? I will, don't worry. Is the sound? Yeah, we're good, we're good. Brilliant. water protectors. Okay, so thinking then about those two questions, first of all, the visual design for the visual narrative, and then second question, the marriage of the English language learning, the, the intercultural learning and the citizenship education. So I'm going to share with you um, the, um, the suggestions I have for the first question, which is the design. Okay, 
So then looking at the covers, so we have the front cover and the back cover, and I have the hardback version here. And you see how the visual design goes across both the front and the back cover. And so let's just see what we can get from this. Often in English language teaching, when picture books are used and I go and see lessons in many different contexts, you know, we go to the title, the author, and then straight into the book, the first opening. And these covers and these um, what we can call peritextual features. So the front cover, the back cover, the dust jacket, the flaps, the end, the front end papers, the back end papers, the blurb, the title page are not included in the lesson when the picture book is shared with children. And that is really missing actually what makes a picture book a picture book, as Sandy Morau often says. And these elements are so important for activating children's schemata, for triggering predictions, for what we can say, enveloping them in the total design of the book. And so it's really important that we do take time to explore these before diving into the story. So if we look then at the covers, we can see the prominence of the water and we see the people in the background, the human chain, if you like, holding hands as if in some kind of protest, perhaps. And um, we see the girl there holding the feather. What might the feather symbolize? What's behind the girl? What might that symbolize? So asking the children what they think these different features of visual design represents starts activating the schemata, getting the curiosity going. So, so important. Making predictions also gives them a reason to listen to the story when you share it and to be really curious and look closely, linking to Bland's idea of deep reading, reading visuals as well as text, of course, when we're talking about picture books and other graphic narratives that deep focus and that deep concentration on those visuals, um, it's not gonna happen without a scaffolded approach. And sharing the paratext in this way provides these, these hooks, these little anchors for children to really engage and to be really curious. Moving on then with the design, so here we have the title page and dedication and also the first opening. So looking at the title page, we are water protectors, and then the dedication often gets missed, yet is so important. So the dedication here comes from both the author and the illustrator. So there are two dedications, and I'll just read that because that's very small on screen. So from um, the author, Carol Lindstrom, she says, to Dan and Sam and to water protectors everywhere. So she's dedicated it to um, some people she knows, but also the global, to water protectors everywhere, and asking the children, you know, what might a water protector do? What do you think a water protector is? Let's share the book and find out. And then from Michaela Goad, who is the illustrator, she says her dedication is for Mother Earth and all who defend her. So asking the children, you know, why do we need to defend Mother Earth? What are the dangers for Mother Earth? So that brainstorming and again that activation. And then setting the scene then here, we see um, the girl with her grandmother actually, and also the other members, the other indigenous um, people who are very much using the water. So again, that first opening is a visual clue to the importance to this indigenous community of water. And um, again, focusing on the peritext also for you as the teacher to find out more about the themes and what has inspired this picture book. So I'm just going to quickly read part of this um, peritext here that says more on water protectors. And this is written by Carol, um, Lindstrom, the author. So she says, this book was created as I became increasingly aware of the many tribal nations that are fighting oil pipelines from crossing their tribal lands and waterways. In April 2016, the Standing Rock Sioux tribe stood against the titans of industry to protect the region's water and sacral burial grounds from these oil pipelines and 
many of you may remember from the news, the focus here is the Dakota Access Pipeline and the protest by the community against that pipeline. And at the end, she says, like Standing Rock Sioux, many tribes and their allies continue to fight pipelines on a daily basis. And this is the big one. This is not just a Native American issue. This is a humanitarian issue. It is time that we all became stewards of our planet so that we protected for our children and our children's children. So the local, the regional, the national and the global all enveloped in this picture book. All right, so going on then through the design, the visual design. So you see there from the colors and the motifs in the illustrations represent, and so this indigenous group is the Anishiabe and their teachings. And you see there from the, you see the grandmother telling the story to the children. So the, the traditions and the teachings all to do with water and how water is so important for the community. Um, and you see there in her hair has actually become water. And that's a very powerful visual symbol that the children can think about, you know, what does it represent? And then um, a quick note from the illustrator, um, Michaela Goad, and she says, um, the standing, the stand, the stand taken, the protest at Standing Rock was historic. I was deeply inspired by the solidarity and wanted the illustrations to convey kinship and unity while representing a diverse group of indigenous nations and allies to honor Carol's culture. So the Carol, the author, I included several details. Um, the main protagonist, so the, the girl, changes into her traditional ribbon skirt as she rallies her people. Additionally, many of the animals in the book reflect Anishiabe symbols or hold special significance in traditional teaching. And the floral designs are inspired by traditional woodland floral motifs. So the potential there for the children finding out about the animals and the symbolism and the flora and the fauna um, connected to the indigenous community, we're seeing here the potential for English language teaching in a little bit of mini research. And these kind of undertakings is exactly what Bland is talking about when she mentions this deep reading approach. Um, moving on then to the whole visual narrative. So um, I gave um, the plot away earlier, telling you it's um, inspired by Link 2, the Dakota Access Pipeline. But you see there the snake. And the image of the snake is actually representing these oil companies and big business wanting to take land, destroy water, pollute water of the communities and so on. And there you see the tears of the community under there, but then a very powerful, the take courage, um, the very powerful uh, arm in the air with the feather. So the symbolism of the feather linking back to the front cover and all the predictions the children made and her hair representing the water. So a very, what I would call evocative visual design here. And then of course, the typographic features. So the features we see in the, the banners and the protest slogans, and there the children could do a little bit of mini research as well onto the, you know, which are, which groups, which indigenous groups are represented there, which languages, um, and of course there's a creative writing task waiting to happen, creating their own banners and slogans. All right then, so the visual design of this picture book and all the picture books we selected for the project has significant potential for English language learning, but how can we teach this, use this vehicle in a way that is accessible, scaffolded, systematic for children of different ages. And this project, the output, if you like, or the outcomes of the project were for the teachers in their Erasmus groups to create a set of materials, and these are called ICE kits, so Intercultural Citizenship Education Kits. And these teaching packs have three main parts. You can see them there. And I'm going to focus particularly now for our last few minutes on part two and part three. So part two is all of the classroom based focus on the picture book. And then part three is where we're inspiring, we're creating mini projects across borders or across context and taking them out into the community.
So I'm going to just share with you, because you can freely download all of these kits, I'm just going to share with you some of my favourite examples. And there you see the, the team, the teacher team who created this ICE kit. One of their activities is a context setting activity to really activate the Marta, get the children curious, get the vocabulary activated as well, is can you drink it? So very hands on experiential activity. So the children have a collection of objects, they put them one by one in the water bottle, and then in terms of developing English, because you know we are language teachers at our core, um, can you drink it, why or why not? So a little bit of um, scientific hypothesizing um, around the impact on objects into the water to symbolize this pollution of water and what happens when water is not drinkable. And then leading to a focus on areas around the world where water isn't safe to drink and why not? And, and so the children, if they are in a context or a country where, you know, you just turn on the tap and drink directly from that, understanding that it, that isn't the case all over the world. Why isn't it? And what can be done to um, address that situation? Then, of course, we, we very importantly in this context is Indigenous people. Um, if the children are not familiar with different Indigenous groups around the world, um, very useful to do some mini web-based research. Um, the children could have a collection of photographs that the teacher supplies and in groups they can ask each other, where do you think they live? What are they wearing? To spark that initial interest in the different groups leading to some mini research around the different groups and then coming back together and share because each group focusing on a different um, indigenous group sharing what they found out so a real reason to use english a real reason to do some mini research and then sharing their outcome their findings together and then this is these activities these photos are from um, the teacher in Portugal who trialed these um, activities in the ice kit with her class. These are Chris's um, learners, as you can see there. So first of all, it was starting to look at to scaffold this. I wanted to show you a little bit of scaffolding here to show that isn't this isn't something we can just do easily and quickly, it needs a scaffolded, supported approach. So first of all, then the um, different regions, continents and countries where we have different indigenous groups around the world, then um, brainstorming questions, they want to find out about all of the groups, and then conducting that online research. And always bearing in mind that we are developing the children's English, and these are some word posters with the Lexus link to the book there. And then um, the, this, these are activities that the teachers created and planned for their classes after reading aloud. So I, I've skipped some steps. So we've got the context setting, we've got sharing those paratextual features that I talked about earlier. Then we have the read aloud itself. Um, and really engaging children, connecting to their predictions, um, predicting the plot, responding to what happens in the story. How do they feel about that? What would they do in that situation? What do they think the girl will do? Um, what can the community do? So all of that questioning. And then after reading aloud, these creative response and follow-up tasks. And so these were the ideas the team came up with. So creating and acting out protest slogans, as I said earlier, that's very naturally triggered by the visual design of the different indigenous groups protesting. And here are some of the slogans the children came up with in Portugal. And creating a water protectors pledge. So again, this is scaffolded by the book itself. You have a pledge here at the back and the children then create their own pledge. What are, what are they going to do in their local community? And what could they then do to extend beyond the local community? And then the environmental the environment people chain. So remember again, that visual design of the human chain and could the children recreate that? outside of the classroom as well, or using arts and crafts and posters of human chains of protest. So this is the example of the pledge. 
And this is the, the worksheet that goes with that. So are you a water protector? Are you an earth steward? Because extending the environmental topic beyond water, what are the other what other aspects of um, conservation are important that we need to protect. So the children then complete with their ideas, I will do my best to, and then the actions. So again, you're seeing this big focus on action taking there. So coming back then to this original um, diagram that shows ice, as we have um, conceptualized it, uh, put it together in the project. So remember we said that it's different contexts, different classes of children is a clear way to think about it, communicating, working on the same picture book, working with the same materials, and then coming together in part three of these ice skips to work on an action-taking cycle through e-twinning. And these are the six different phases of the action taking cycle through E20. And these are the activities that the, the Erasmus group planned for their classes. So in the discover phase, it was brainstorming as many ways they could think of to save water in their homes and communities. And then using those ways to create an informative dual language flyer, then getting together with the children in the other context using a video call that could be through zoom or whatever device that school are using and um, sharing their ideas for the flyers so as a class they have come up or in groups they've come up with their different flyer ideas then they're sharing them with another class and then kind of negotiating in english with the support of the teacher using their children's own languages to come up with okay well what would be the best things to include in a flyer for saving water and then agreeing together or co-creating together and planning where are we going to give out these flyers are they going to be paper are they going to be digital when are we going to give them out and how are we going to share these flyers in the community and then after that moving on then to taking the action into the community and thinking of ways that the children can get feedback from the community what do you think of this flyer and not just what do you think of the flyer, but what are you, person receiving flyer, going to do to save water? What do you pledge? And, you know, as we said about the dirty socks, we can't guarantee anyone will do anything, but we can only but try and engage their interests and spark their interests. And children's voices can, as we've seen with the Greta effect, can be very powerful actually in doing that. And then once they've got a little bit of feedback from the community, what did you think of our flyers? They get together in the video call again and they share their results and the community responses. And finally then, very importantly for intercultural citizenship education, coming back and reflecting on this experience. What did we learn then about taking action and saving water? How do you feel about taking action in the local community? And that should say, what do you now want to do next? Or what do you want to learn more about? So um, really emphasizing the fact that it isn't just we do this, tick the box, it's done and we forget about it. How can then that inspire ongoing action for me personally, for my family, for my community and beyond? So that's how part three of the ice kit goes way beyond the picture book, but the picture book remains that constant vehicle, that catalyst that can spark the action taking. So to wrap up then, when working together as an international community of practice, as in the ice pulp project, as an ICOP, a democratic citizen takes responsibility for themselves and their communities. And if we create materials together with teachers in different contexts, working on the same book, working with the same activities, with intercultural citizenship goals in mind, this helps children engage in what Short calls authentic action. We help children work on those UNESCO goals of being proactive contributors in a an action orientated and a political way and hopefully the biggest aspiration is to improve the community or the communities in which we live and that is both local and global. 
So um, hopefully that was um, inspiring for you. Hopefully you now feel a little bit more confident or interested in using picture books as ice vehicles. If you want more inspiration and you want to try some of these co-created materials by teachers for teachers out for yourselves with your own learners, you can freely download those ice kits from the website, the icepel.eu website. There are 18 kits. And it'd be really interesting for us to know the IcePel partners. You know, did you try this out with your class? Which bits worked? Which didn't? What did you adapt and why? That would be really fascinating to see how this project gets shared and disseminated around the world. And as all of the references that I've shared with you in this webinar are um, included in this guide. Now, this is also freely downloadable. It's actually 118 pages, but it's very readable, as very reader friendly and very clearly and systematically laid out. And I'd really recommend you download the guide and read this and refer to this as a touchstone, if you like, in conjunction with the kids. So you are not only experimenting with those materials, but you're seeing the rationales, the underpinnings, the foundations behind those kits. And hopefully, then you'll feel confident to choose your own picture book, create your own kit, and link with um, classes of children in other contexts as an international community of citizens. If you've enjoyed this webinar, hope you have, hope it's been um, useful for you. We'd like to invite you to our conference. And so our closing conference for this project is um, this week, actually, the 1st and the 2nd of July, and the closing date for registration is completely free to join um, online. If you're in Portugal, the face-to-face, um, -face, it's a hybrid conference, the face-to-face -face is full, which is wonderful, but we would love if the people attending this webinar if you could come virtually to some of the sessions or all of the sessions, it'd be amazing. Um, and you can register the website closing registration on the site. The link is there at the bottom. It's tomorrow at midnight Portugal time. So um, it would be great to see you there virtually in the chat box at the IcePel Hybrid Conference. And the final message, and this is from Margaret Mead, which I very much believe in, and this project has hoped to live by this. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much. Fantastic. About to give you a round of applause then, but I, I will do anyway. <laughs> and anyone else can can also, uh, hopefully if you finish your ice creams, then you can give a round of applause as well. Sorry, just to loop back to that at the beginning. Um, fantastic. Well done. That was brilliant. Really, really, I mean, yeah, fantastic. The fact that there are no questions is, I, I was sort of concerns me, but then it also makes me think that's that's good that there are no questions because people were obviously hugely engaged and um i had no messages or questions about the certificate or anything everyone was was fully um yeah watching you as i was and uh yeah brilliant 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 thank you <laughs> um so the work there were actually i'll say that questions there were there were a couple of questions from facebook and there are a couple that come up in the chat. If anyone does have any more, we've probably only got about five minutes actually for questions. Um, but uh, this was a question I think related to when you're talking about the chocolate milkshake and the um, the dirty socks uh, from Joe Tsai uh, about students. Did they did they have to kind of justify their answers with that with that activity or with uh, do you know? I suppose maybe it happened in a classroom in another country, so maybe you don't. But was the idea that they would have to sort of say, I would take this because blah, 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 blah. Yes, yes, you know, so if I'm take, I think it's supposedly, uh, it's obviously the goal is to encourage empathy. So, you know, we, we, we have no time, it's dangerous, we need to jump on the plane, what would we grab? And I would actually say, there is nobody on earth who can truly empathize with that situation because mm. that is so horrific and harrowing and distressing that unless you've lived it, I don't think anyone can empathize with it. So it's more 
the focus, I think, is a little bit um, misguided, to be honest. I think it should be, well, if children and families are coming to our country, how can we welcome them? Mm. So it, it's what can we do realistically and to learn more about their experiences, but we can never identify, unless um, someone has had a refugee experience, I personally don't think we can identify with that. So I think that's why it's sometimes hard for children to really see, well, what's the teacher on about? But I think if we take this deep reading approach mm. and we are really exploring through those characters, and the character's experience, I think that really helps children come closer to understanding. But I don't think anyone can ever empathize with, with, ex, with experiences that we haven't had ourselves. I, I really do believe that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was, I mean, it was obviously a, a really, I can tell from the way you're talking about it, it was a project that you, that you have, have had a very positive, experience with and and obviously this been working with some fantastic um people who are in the webinar today actually watching um what i suppose with with projects like this is that they're, they're finite you know so there's a start and, and an end but in 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 the the talk you were talking about you know this sort of concept this idea it doesn't end there it kind of goes goes beyond it goes how how do you how do you kind of i suppose the question is what what, what do you do next with something like this where, where do you take this next well, I'd like to think of the materials and the guide that um, gives a foundation to the materials. I'd like to think of these as blueprints. And so myself, I've integrated them into my uh, in-service teacher ed in Norway, for example, in my courses um, for primary ELT. And I know lots of the other partners who are teacher educators have brought the materials into their projects. And um, we attended a conference it was just a few days ago in Spain and um, we presented the project and colleagues at that conference wanted them to try it out. I mean, I'm talking a lot about teacher educators here because that's what we do, but it, I think it'd be also great if teachers themselves, you know, through their um, virtual network, um, perhaps through so in the social media groups, the teacher groups they're in, if they um, identified a colleague that is teaching a similar age, a similar language level, and you know, linking up together with them. I, I think what the project does, and, and you're absolutely right, Paul, is so many Erasmus Plus projects get lost when they finish. Right. And we hope to keep IcePel alive. And I think that can only happen if teachers then um, become passionate about picture books, try them out, create materials, and do this um, context to context virtual mm -hmm. collaboration and then the big thing that i'd end with is share what happens mm. you know really tell us um you know and and sandy says there and that's an excellent note to finish on mm. and sandy is the project leader um, of ice Pell, and she says well we're reproducing the professional development course so I, I should have said that actually that the materials creation and the picture book selection and so on came out of a teacher development course so they, they have sessions on this and she's saying here we are reproducing that course on the European school education platform okay. so that's getting renewed at the moment but hopefully that will be a lot will be live and accessible soon great brilliant okay that's good to know um okay we'll leave it there um thank you david i really really appreciate that and fantastic a fantastic project really yeah really great and a lot of enthusiasm for it in the comments i think a lot of people who perhaps weren't aware of it, this before have now registered for the conference um the online aspect of it and uh and we'll be downloading the kit so um brilliant okay we'll so leave much. it there thank you so much david um just before everyone goes just to let you know about a webinar we have coming up i'm sorry i'm just gonna no, i'm not gonna share it um on uh thursday this thursday with um claire Steele and sarah smith uh, and they'll be doing the second part of their designing um tasks uh creative tasks i will um 
just okay how to design tasks which promote creative thinking skills and that's on thursday so in two days uh, at the same time so if you haven't registered for that you can um you just go to the teaching english website and uh, and you can find it there uh and so hopefully we'll see you on thursday or well, someone already has marvelous um okay that's all from us uh enjoy the rest of your day uh morning afternoon evening and we will see you uh next time hopefully on thursday Take care. Bye-bye.